Thank you all uh, for joining us and, and filing in. And for those of us, or for those of you who will be tuning in after the event is, uh, is done being live. My name is Andy Frisky. I am a, a senior dream curator at Dream Bank. I'm really excited to have the, uh, the panel here discussing today, uh, short-term and long-term rentals. Um, but before we go ahead and do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what Dream Bank is, uh, who we are, and, and why we are here. So Dream Bank is a free community resource that is located in the heart of Madison, Wisconsin, and we are put on by American Family Insurance. The whole reason why we exist is to help inspire people to pursue their dreams, and in large part, that's done through the programs that we offer. So we host 11 different event series uh, in our space, anything ranging from small business and entrepreneurial workshops to inspiration and motivational wellness speaker series. We host family-related activities. We even have a, a crafting series, uh, as well as events in Spanish. So uh, this will, will more than likely be aired on our Facebook page. So if you're viewing this on Facebook after the fact, go ahead and press that events tab. That'll give you a good concise list of the events that we have upcoming, in addition to all of the events that we've been putting out uh, virtually since the beginning of the pandemic, right around the end of March in 2020. Um, but like I mentioned, we've got a great uh, panel assembled today talking about uh, rental properties. Uh, without further ado, though, I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to our moderator, Katie Powell, and she's going to kick things up. Katie, take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Andy. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, so we really appreciate your time here. But as your moderator, we're going to be discussing the pros and cons of investing in a short or long term rental property. Maybe you're like me and you recently had an amazing Airbnb experience and thought, why don't I own one of these? Or maybe you would like to provide long-term housing solutions for a family in your community. Regardless, today you'll hear from our rental property experts as they answer our questions to help you realize your dream of owning an income property. So why don't we go ahead and meet our panelists. First up, we have Trevor Patches, who is an American Family Insurance agent in Illinois. Trevor owns one short-term rental property located in Wisconsin. This property also has an event space located on the premise. Trevor has owned this property since February of 2019, and he has hired a property manager to operate the ins and the outs of managing his income property. Next up, we have Cindy Long. Cindy lives in the suburbs of St. Louis, Missouri, and she recently sold her three long-term rentals. Cindy owned and managed these properties for over 25 years while maintaining several long-term tenants, some of which rented her place for up to five years. And last but certainly not least, we have Michael Goldman. Michael owns one short-term uh, vacation rental, which he has owned for a year and a half. His property is located on the Oregon coast, which is approximately a six hour drive from his home. Immediately following this panel, he's actually headed up there with his family to spend some time staring at the water instead of staring at Zoom. So um, I wanna thank each of our panelists for joining us today. Um, in regards to housekeeping, if you have any questions um, throughout today's discussion, please feel free to throw those in the chat or the Q&A, and we will certainly get to those as uh, we're able to. So with that, why don't we jump on in to our very first question, and that's actually for the entire group, each of our panelists, if you could answer the following question. So I really wanna start from the beginning of your journey when it comes to rental properties, whether that's short or long-term investing. So can you each share um, how and why you are interested in owning a rental and owning a rental property. Um, Michael, can we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. So um, kind of the short version of is every time we visited the Oregon coast, we kind of fell in love with it more and more. And at one point kind of decided, well, it'd be nice to have a place on the coast uh, that we can, you know, eventually retire to. And one way to help fund that is uh, oh, basically have somebody else pay for it while we own it in the meantime. And so we got a short-term vacation rental. Uh, we spent a good year finding a place be just because there's different regulations about uh, the legality of short-term vacation rentals uh, in each of the different cities along the coast. So finally found a spot the, that worked out. And yeah, that was, the whole goal was most of the time have it rented out and then occasionally use it for our own purposes, which is exactly what we'll be doing um, 
in about an hour here. Sounds like a good plan to me. Uh, Cindy, could you share um, your experience in regards to how and why you wanted to get started with rental properties? Yeah, sure. So um, I guess my journey kind of started when I was um, growing up. Uh, my father was a realtor and a broker, um, and he got into um, buying residential houses and keeping them um, as renters. Um, he had his properties for a long time and then um, gradually sold them off as myself and my siblings went to college and it helped put the college bills. Um, so as I went to college and got out of school, I decided um, it's a good investment, help diversify, you know, my investment portfolio. And so of learning, you know, how my father did it, I started with one property um, with the goal of buying it and keeping it for a long time that Hopefully, if I got married and had kids, I would have that either to give to my child or to use as college funds. And I ended up buying three properties, um, had three kids. So um, it worked out well. Very good. Family business. I love it. And Trevor, could you share your experience and what got you in interested? So similar to my other panelists and friends on here, um, we were looking for some sort of investment property for income. A um, little different is, is we've done a lot of traveling through Airbnb and we've done a handful of different experiences in different towns and different countries, uh, different places around the world. And when we've rented those um, different uh, short-term rentals or Airbnbs, we found that some of the things that we liked, some of the things we didn't like, and um, my wife is very creative and she has decided that she would be able to do something better than the experiences that we've uh, enjoyed. So we went out and decided to do um, a property of farm uh, to create a different experience. Um, farm is within 10 minutes of a lake, but it's not the lake house traditional experience that we see a lot of. It's more of an open air, um, just a different type of environment where you can take the family and um, literally unplug. Um, you've got a basket where you drop your phones in and do those types of things. and. And our you know, dream was to create uh, something unique for others to be able to enjoy and um, for us to be able to enjoy as a family as well. Great, thank you each for sharing um, really how you got started and, and kind of laid down the roots for us. So we'll jump into some more questions here. Um, why don't we start with Cindy? What steps did you take to find your rental property? So you mentioned that you own three, um, at some point in time. Could you take us through the journey of what you did to own your first property and then how you obtained more properties from there? Yeah, sure. So um, I knew I wanted to kind of manage it myself. Um, and so I wanted something that was close by um, where I lived. Um, so I worked with a realtor and I told him what I was looking for, kind of what my budget was. And um, he helped me get, you know, see several properties. Um, I wanted something that was kind of family oriented in a very good school district, um, something that was not too large, not a large piece of land, so it would be fairly easy to maintain. Um, and I just kind of went from there. I bought one and I had it about, I'd say probably three or four years and it was working out really well. And so I had saved up enough um, investment money and purchased the second one. And then it was probably another three years before I got my third one. And they're all fa fairly close. Um, they weren't very far. And I used the same realtor for, for all of the purchases. So we understood what my goals were as keeping them as, as a long-term property. I love that. And I love using the same person so you can kind of walk through that journey with them. Well, um, Cindy, just a follow-up question. What was some of the criteria you had to ensure that it was a good investment? Um, well, we looked at the age of the property, um, you know, the physical conditions of the property, and then also really the neighborhood that it was in um, to see if the neighborhood was growing, if it was going more commercial. Um, and then with it being a family house, also the school district I knew was important. And that will kind of help keep your renters there if you're in a good school district, because if they start out with kids in elementary, they want to kind of stay with that school district throughout the years. And that in turn helps your, your long-term um, tenants to keep those on hand. Great, and certainly something that um, makes everyone's life a little bit easier too. So awesome, thanks for sharing. 
Um, Michael, our next question is for you. Very similar. How did you find your property and how did you know that it would be a good investment? Yeah, so um, I got introduced to a company called Vacasa, V-A-C-A-S-A, and they're basically they're a vacation rental property management company, but they're very end to end. And so one of the things that they helped me do, we we identified kind of like the key things that we wanted in in a property, right? We, we knew we wanted a view of the water. It doesn't have to be on the beach because that might be outrageously expensive, but we knew at least wanted a view of the water, three bedrooms. Um, somewhere on the Washington, Oregon coast. And that was kind of it. And then, you know, obviously the, the goal was to get a place that was, um, my goal was ultimately if it, if it breaks even from a cash flow standpoint, that's good enough for me because then I basically get use of a vacation rental for free and build up the equity in the meantime. And so one of the things that, uh, that this company does is they actually have analysts that will work with you. So if you send them some properties that you're finding on Zillow, for example, um, or you know, even through their realtor that they have, they will they will run the property through the system based on what they know of the area, the average rents, you know, what down payment you you know you're going to be putting in, you know, what your kind of loan parameters are, expected monthly bills, and then they can tell you on average what you can expect as your return on investment. And then the, the other benefit of it is that they, um, and I, th I think I saw a question coming in that might, this might help address too, is they, they do all of the legwork with regards to um, like applications and making sure that everything's compliant and legal within the parameters of a given town or location or even an HOA to make sure that a short-term rental is applicable. So we had actually had a few places that would have worked, but the city had some either uh, substantial restrictions on short-term vacation rentals, or they had like an hour or sorry, a year long waiting period uh, because they had a moratorium on them. So we excluded those properties at that point in time, but I would have never known that if it wasn't for working with somebody that can do all that legwork for me, so. That's great. And yeah, that, I mean, that's amazing that they were able to do some of that research to help you understand, to meet the long-term needs of your property. So that's awesome. Um, Trevor, I, one question for you. What interested you in purchasing such a unique property? You mentioned that it's a farm um, near the lake um, in a different state than you're located in. So uh, it's got an event space. What interested you in the unique property? Um, well, we, we looked at it as what would we want to do? Where would we want to stay? Um, our market is, you know, our, our friends and family. I mean, the folks that are just like us, a um, couple kids working hard, husband and wife both working, looking for the ability to, you know, uh, invest in something and to enjoy something that we would want to, to go to, similar to, you know, what Michael was saying. Um, and, our uh, dream wasn't just to have the Airbnb or the rental property uh, for short terms, but also to do some uh, unique events and things of that sort. So uh, my goal was to find a very specific type of barn. My wife's goal was to find a very specific house. And um, <laughs> we spent the good part of probably two and a half years driving around Wisconsin um, we wanted to be in Wisconsin. They wanted to be within three hours of our house. It was kind of our range. Uh, so it was easily drivable. We could draw from Chicago. We can draw from Milwaukee. We can even draw from Madison, um, allowing us to pull from some of these bigger cities to give the metro market kind of that rural feel. Um, it just so happened that barn weddings in the last 10 years have taken off exponentially. And that just parlayed us into, you know, step one to two to three to four. And um, we got very lucky um, uh, in finding this particular property. Um, it had been on, on the market for almost four years, which sounds like a negative, uh, which in most cases I would probably say it would be. However, we were using the property much differently than what the other buyers that were in that particular uh, town were able to do. So because of our business model, we were able to pull it off financially where it might've been um, a struggle if it would have been, you know, a family looking to work the land. It wasn't big enough land to offset the cost of that height. So there's just a lot of things that fell into our favor and, and uh, it worked out quite well. 
Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, it sounds like a really cool property to be on. Um, Trevor, I know that Michael mentioned that he uses uh, Vicasa as his property management. Do you use any uh, property managers or um, any services to help list your property? So we've been on Airbnb for since the inception, uh, so for a couple of years now. Um, we recently, last year, joined uh, VRBO. The systems do integrate, they do chat with each other. So when you have a calendar and somebody books on Airbnb, it immediately pulls it off of VRBO. Um, uh, we're a little bit more used to Airbnb and it seems a little more user friendly for the communication with our guests. Um, during COVID, it was, you know, you weren't allowed to be there, you had certain parameters. So, you know, keyless entry or entry without people being there. It was a lot easier to communicate um, ways to do that with our guests that were coming in. Um, ERBO, we're, we're still trying to get our balance with, but uh, I think both of them were a good, uh, a good reason to be on both. They're not terribly expensive uh, to be on, on, on both of them. I haven't looked at Macasa because that's it's more of a robust system. We're kind of doing more of a self-managing um, I definitely could see how that would be really helpful for, for Michael's property. And um, I actually have other clients that I insure that use the same service. And I heard that they're great, um, but for what we needed, um, we haven't done literally any advertising. And um, just being on Airbnb and getting the support from those types of platforms has been very beneficial to us. Yeah, that's certainly great because you you weigh the costs, right? Of what are the fees to be listed on this platform um, versus my marketing fees that I might um, have. So it's great that it kind of balances out simply from being on the platform, which is awesome. All right. So the next question is for Cindy. Um, whenever you had a vacancy for your property or any of your properties, how did you promote your property to potential tenants? So you guys will laugh at this, but you know, I had mine like 25 something years ago. So that was back when you advertised in the newspaper, um, you know, as a rental property. Um, so of course you use the newspaper. Um, and then another thing I did too, is I just put a sign in the yard that said for rent um, with my phone number. And actually I got a lot of renters off of that because people, families would drive around to the neighborhoods they wanted to rent in. Um, you know, on Sunday afternoons. So um, that was another good thing and also very inexpensive. And then, of course, as time went on, um, you know, and the internet evolved and we started uh, posting stuff on the internet. Great. Yeah, certainly a lot of different ways to get the word out. So my next question is for Trevor and Michael. Um, Michael, why don't we start with you? Do you know if you have had any repeat guests at your property and what are some of the like tactics or amenities that you're hoping that guests experience that will encourage them to return? So uh, the first part of the question, I honestly don't. Um, I'm very, and, and this goes to kind of Trevor's point on the platform that you choose to use is, is kind of the level of involvement that you want with your with your property. And I intentionally wanted to be as hands off as possible. Um, so because Vacasa manages it all, and it, realistically, it's only been on the market for a year because the first six months of ownership was in the you know right as everything got locked down and travel was restricted. Um, so I don't actually know if we've had a uh, return guest, but one of the things or a few of the things that we've done to kind of make it a place that people want to re return to is so we've, we've got a hot tub uh, in the backyard, which always helps. Right. And then uh, we've made the property pet friendly and we advertise it as such, um, which especially on the in the Pacific Northwest is kind of a big deal. A lot of folks want to bring their dogs on their trips these days and, you know, all the floors there are hardwood. So it's not really any issue with regards to like, you know, carpets getting messed up or, or what have you. Um, so it honestly, it's just that kind of stuff. And it's, you know, it's intentionally designed as kind of a quiet getaway. It's, it's away from everything. You just sit out on the front deck and stare out at the water basically. But I actually couldn't tell you if we had return guests or not. I know it's well rated and well reviewed because I, I have to check those things because uh, it's, it's something I just want to know, but th that's about all I know about uh, how people like it. That's good. That's great. 
Um, Trevor, same question to you. Uh, what kind of amenities do you have in place to encourage repeat uh, guests? Um, so we took it to um, a, a bit of a different level where we're able to offer um, services like stock the fridge and stock the bar. Um, we have a liquor license, so I'm able to sell uh, alcohol on premise. We've got a, a small wine room that Folks are able to go in and pull a bottle of wine from and send a Venmo to, you know, pay for it. Um, we've also um, have uh, put together a few relationships with some local vendors and chefs. Um, so we're able to cater to, um, we've had anniversaries, we've had, um, you know, bachelorette parties, we've had, um, reunions where nobody wants to cook. They want a chef to come into the house. Um, we've had several politicians come through. We've had several um, professional hockey teams and things of that sort where they're looking for a place to kind of get away. And, um, and then we're, we bring in the chef, we bring in, you know, the different situations that they want to, you know, have taken care of. We've done we're near Whistling Straits, so we've got a unique event going for the Ryder Cup. Um, you know, we've got driver services. So there's a handful of things that we're dangling out there for an additional cost um, for folks. And um, it's been pretty well received. Uh, we do leave a nice gift basket. Um, you know, our place is, has a couple day minimum. I'm sure Michael yours does as well. And, and um, with that, we're driving a certain type of clientele um, because of the cost and the size of the property. So our our gift basket is anywhere between probably our cost of thirty five to one hundred dollars with each guest. So it's you know it's we're trying to give a little bit of extra because you're getting a little bit of extra, and, and um, we've gotten some nice notes from that. We've got a lot of repeats uh, that have come through. Um, the other is that we have a, uh, a book. We just bought like a cool um, sign-in book and just ask people to write down, you know, how you're feeling. And I've seen three languages, <laughs> uh, none of which I can interpret. So I hope it's something polite and pleasant, uh, but it's been neat to see and just people's experiences that, um, you know, the TV, we decided to tell the kids it didn't work so that we could all play games. And we have you know, all sorts of different card games and board games and old school backgammon and air hockey. And so it's just, we've, we've thought of all the, again, the things that we would want as a family of four and a larger family of 15. If we were traveling as a group, what would we want to do? What would we want to experience? And, and, um, I tell you, the book, if you ever do rent your place out on a short-term rental, put a book in there and encourage people to write in it. It is really, I mean, you get some teary-eyed things that are going on sometimes, some of the folks that are enjoying the property and their experience with it. So it's been pretty neat. That is so cool. I love um, like the local experiences that you curate uh, with the chefs and things of that nature. And then um, you know, the bringing it all together, right? Like with the book and, uh, you know, that way other people can read previous um, experiences. So that's really cool. Um, we do have a question from um, the audience for Michael. Um, this is really as it relates to your management choice with through Vacasa and how does it feel to have people in your home that you don't know, you know, they're, they're cleaning, they're managing it, they're doing all of the things. So does that make you uneasy ever? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so it's, it's a uh, funny question because we, we went through a little bit of that like psychologically, right? And I, I think I would say this for everyone. Um, and I, I don't know, Trevor and Cindy, hopefully you agree, but you, you come to this kind of decision early on when you buy the property with the understanding that like, while it's rented out, whether it's short term or long term, it's not yours. None of the stuff in there is yours. Like when we go there, we, we treat it like it's somebody, you know, like, yeah, we know it's our place, but it's effectively like it's somebody else's vacation rental. We abide by the same rules. Like we check in after four, we check out at 10. Um, and then all the stuff that we bought for it was stuff that we bought 
to be used while it's a vacation rental. Like the honest truth is at some point when we move in there, you know, at retirement, we're going to replace all the stuff that's in there with our own, but everything that's in there, you know, like stains will happen on the, on the table or, you know, somebody will, we had like kitchen knives that got stolen and it's like, who steals kitchen knives? But it's like, okay, that's not a big deal. Just replace them. Like none of the stuff that's in there is ours. As far as, you know, we own the place and we provide it as something for people to use um, and hopefully they make good memories in there, like like Trevor said. But like psychologically, I think that's something to definitely mentally prepare yourself for ahead of buying a place is just assume that it's not yours and, and you will feel differently about how everything in there is treated and folks coming in and cleaning and whatnot. And the honest truth of it is a professional cleaning company that comes in uh, after every person is going to do a hell of a lot better of a job cleaning that place than I ever will. So that part I'm definitely not worried about. I'm curious what kind of kitchen knives you had. Um, if they must have been super sharp or <laughs> something. They were like uh, grocery store bought kitchen knives because you don't, you know, you have to buy like all this. You know, when you when you move from one house to another, you're taking a good portion of your stuff with you. When you buy another place, you have to furnish it with everything all at the same time. You're like, oh man, we need like plates and silverware and knives and all this other stuff. So we're like, those look cool. Let's get those. Uh, they must have thought they looked very cool too. I love though, Michael, in all seriousness, how you summarize that you have to look at this as an investment, right? Like it's a business, take the emotion out of it um, and, and just kind of go with it from that point of view. So thank you for sharing that. Our next question is for Cindy. So you, man or you mentioned that you manage the uh, properties yourself. Um, what was it about managing it, the properties yourself that interested you versus hiring someone else to do that for you? Um, I'd say just because I'm pretty anal and I need to know what's going on, <laughs> be honest. Um, but also I looked at it, it's, it's a long-term investment and my renters were long-term. So it wasn't like I was changing renters every other weekend and had to deal with it a lot of hours. Um, so there's, you know, the screening of the renters up front, the preparing of the property. So you had time there. But then after once you got the renters in, it was more just like making sure the rent came in every month. Um, and you didn't really talk to them too much until hopefully until the end of the year when you had to sign a new lease. Um, so in that respect, it wasn't like I was there every weekend cleaning or cutting the yard because that was their responsibility. So it wasn't a, a large uh, amount of my time that I had to invest, um, on a monthly basis. Great. And we actually have, um, a follow-up question from the chat that came through Cindy for you in regards to any problem renters that you might have um, encountered with maybe unable to pay rent or um, di just destructive of your property? And how did you uh, work with those tenants and manage that? Yeah, so um, I can tell you stories. I could go on and on about stories about good renters and then bad ones too. Um, so yes, there were renters that didn't uh, were not able to pay rent. Um, and my approach was that was to meet with them and understand their scenario and what was going on in their life that, you know, why they couldn't pay rent and, and work out, you know, a payment process with them. Some, you know, were able to pay everything later on and I just had to be patient and I knew that they were upfront with me and what was going on. Um, and then there were some that uh, I did have to evict. I had one that I had to evict because they just did not pay. Um, they were going through a really messy divorce. They had kids that were just wild on drugs. It was a bad, bad situation um, after they moved in. They had been there about two years and then everything fell apart. Um, so they, she wasn't able to pay rent and her kids were just destructive. I had to evict them from the house. So, um, you know, that, that was, you know, a year of loss for me for not having rent, going through the eviction process and then repairing the damage that they did. Um, but hopefully that doesn't happen too often. You know, when you buy a house, you try to screen your tenants real good, um, you try to get to know them. Um, and just, and that's another reason I wanted the properties close to me so I could drive by whenever I wanted to um, and see what was going on. Because you can tell a lot from the outside of the house if they're upkeeping the outside, may possibly how they're upkeeping the inside. 
Um, and then another point too, I got to know the neighbors really good. And the neighbors will tell you when there's stuff going on, when the police is coming, that kind of stuff. So um, getting to know your neighbors um, is a key thing too. Thank you for sharing that. You know, it's not all rainbows and sunshine when it comes to owning uh, this business, right? So it's important to understand the pros and the cons, which is really the point of this discussion. So, um, you know, it sounds like there were some duds, but you also had a really good experience with others. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I mean, um, I my next one where- Yeah, the, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I had one um, tenant moved in, her child was five years old and they stayed until he um, was like 18 years old. And, um, you know, I co-signed on her car for her. I co-signed when she bought her house um when she moved out and she, i never heard a peep from her she kept everything you know great so she was a wonderful tenant so most of the time you get really good ones but every now and then you get a bad apple yeah that's a really cool uh story cindy how you kind of served as a mentor honestly for that uh young adult so that's awesome thank you for sharing that so my next question is for uh, Michael and Trevor. We'll start with you, Michael. Um, would you consider owning a long-term rental property? Um, and why or why not? Um, I mean, I'm never going to say every, anything is a definite no. So like if the right circumstances came up, sure, I totally would. Um, but that said, I would say if I, you know, given a given a first opportunity, I'd probably get another vacation rental just because it appeals to me more and not honestly, not for any other reason. Um, I think you would go through the same scenario of identifying like what you need from a cash flow standpoint and, and whether, you know, rent on a place makes sense or not. Um, so I would have to answer the same questions I would if I was to get another vacation rental. It's just more for me, like my own personal preference would probably be to have another vacation rental. But that's not because one is any more or less valid than another. Yeah, no, great point. I love the like, know yourself, right? And know what you're going to enjoy owning. So um, Trevor, same question to you. Would you consider owning a long-term rental and why or why not? Um, so most likely no, I, 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 that's not our style. Um, our plan with this particular rental is to parlay and to Again, find other places in the world um, that we would like to, to live. Um, I think the next one we're, we've been looking for about a year now um, to maybe do an apartment someplace, an apartment in a big city, someplace we'd like to visit, someplace we can fly direct to. Um, Spain is, is top on our list, but we have to find out what we're allowed to own and not allowed to own in foreign countries. But um, that's kind of our, our style. Um, we like to travel a lot. Uh, I think it's a lot less wear and tear on the house um, when you're not living in it, um, but maybe 20 weekends a year, 22 weekends a year, something like that. <clears throat> so um, that, that's more uh, what kind of fits our, our style of, uh, of living. And again, that's, that's why we're doing this is so that we can capitalize, like Michael said, on going to a place that we want to go visit and vacation to, um, we have a similar uh, approach to it as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Cindy, similar question for you. Uh, would you ever consider owning a short-term rental property and why or why not? Yeah, I, I definitely would. I think um, in today's world, you know, it's, you've got resources and um, like both of these guys said, um, you get a personal benefit from it as well as an investment. Um, you you have help if you if you want it, depending you know how much time you want to work on it personally. Um, but you definitely have the different platforms that can you know do the property management for you and everything. So I think I think yeah, if you can find the right property with the right um, cost benefit for you, um, it's it's a great thing to do. Great. We have another question from um, the audience. So please keep those coming. These are great to see. So thank you for that. Um, this is actually for Cindy when it comes to really maintenance on your properties. And um, honestly, this could be said for, this could be a question for Trevor as well. When it comes to maintenance, um, would you do some of the maintenance yourself or would you hire that out? Um, 
what what was your experience with the maintenance issues? So um, I'm kind of lucky in that my husband is a contractor. <laughs> So that if there were some maintenance things, he could definitely address them. Um, every now and then, you know, we did have to hire, you know, a sewer company or, or an HVAC guy. Um, but I'm not afraid to tackle things, um, you know, cleaning out the gutters if we needed to, trimming the trees, resealing the driveway, painting, all that kind of stuff. Um, we tried to handle as most we could between my husband and I. But yeah, there were times when you had to um, call a contractor in. And again, we tried to use the same contractors all the time. So they knew our property, they knew our systems, um, and you tend to get better rates then too. Good. Yeah, Trevor, uh, some, the same question over to you. Any maintenance um, issues that have happened since you've owned your property and how did you address them? Um, <clears throat> the first comment I'd make is this. I, I, I seem to be a lot better at doing things at the farm than I am at the place in Evanston. So I don't know if that's just a mental block for me, but I'm, I feel like if I break something out there, it's not that big of a deal. Um, but we, we hire a lot local. That was one of our things that we wanted to do. Um, we're in a, you know, a half a million dollar construction project at the, at the property right now. So uh, we've got a lot of contractors who we're, we're working with, um, but on the main house, we're, we found a, a retired um, Marine who's super handy, and he only works on properties that he likes the people, you know, he can pick and choose his clients type thing, and we were fortunate enough to, to hit it off with him. Um, our property manager, she's very handy. Um, she loves to be involved in... Um, from landscaping to plumbing to painting. Um, and similar to Cindy, my spouse is actually very handy as well. So um, she's doing a lot of that. Um, her, her career allows her some more freedoms to be able to go up and to work on some things. Um, but yeah, we're, we're doing as much of it as we can, um, but we're, we're hiring as much local um, contractors we can. We're in a small town. I mean, we we make up 1% of the population in our town. So it's pretty small. You know? So there's less than 500 people. Um, but it's been it's been good to, to do a little bit of both and then hire where you know you're, you're outside of your comfort levels. Yeah. And Trevor, just out of curiosity, um, for my own uh, curiosity, how did you find those local contractors, especially since you are for the further away from your property? Um, that, that was a challenge for sure. So we went to um, a couple town hall meetings. Um, we um, worked with a lot of local restaurants. There's a couple resorts. Um, we're right outside of Elkhart Lake. So in Elkhart Lake, there are a number of larger resorts. We met the owners of those resorts and spent time there. And, in, and when you spend time at your property on a Tuesday, you know, during the week and you go out to dinner, uh, I'm naturally an outgoing person. So I'm talking to people and then your waitress's uh, brother is a carpenter and his cousin is also a painter. And then all of a sudden you've got a painter and a carpenter and, and it just, it just literally just kind of opened up from there. But um, just made it known that we're coming into town. I mean, when you buy a property this size in a small town, everybody knows about it. Um, so we got a lot of people approaching us um, that wanted to do some work on the property. And, you know, you have to be careful. We kind of weeded through some things and found some people we could trust. And, and that small town feel has been, has been really good to us. And um, we're trying to be respectful and give back and, and spend money as, as, as local as we possibly can. And, and I think that's been really appreciated. Um, you know, we're giving out jobs that, that might not have been there and, and spending money in different ways. And, um, you know, they seem to, it seems to be a nice, nice relationship that we have going. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Um, a question from the audience came in for Michael as it relates to maintenance on your property. So 
Um, does Vacasa do they handle all of the maintenance and then charge you after? What is the process whenever there's any maintenance issues on your property? Yeah, so so I'll, I'll say just in general, their cost structure. So Vacasa charges 35% of gross rent for end-to-end -end support. That means cleaning, advertising, general maintenance, like all of that kind of stuff. Um, if, if there's repairs that need to be done above and beyond the general maintenance, they'll generally, you know, if it's minor, they take, uh, they hold like 500 bucks in a reserve account just to handle some of that stuff quickly. Um, if it's anything, you know, of major size, they'll ask you what you want to do. So if you have somebody that you happen to work with and, and know and like and trust, they'll, they'll definitely use that person. If you need recommendations or quotes, then they'll actually do all that work. They won't charge you the labor of like finding somebody and, you know, getting somebody out there and everything like that. They just pass through whatever the cost is of, of fixing the thing that needs to get fixed. Great, really hands off, which um, is yeah. good. So that, that, yeah. that's awesome. Um, we have a, another uh, couple of questions in, from the audience that I think are uh, somewhat related. So Nick mentioned that the housing market in their area is absolutely nuts, as it is in most of the country right now. Um, so generally speaking, what are all of your thoughts on is now the right time to buy a rental property, whether that's short term or long term. Obviously, none of us have a crystal ball, so it's really just um, you know whatever our personal preference is. But Cindy, I, I'd like to start with you because it sounds like you've purchased multiple properties over different periods of time. So, what were your thoughts whenever it came to like is now the right time to be buying a property? Yeah, a couple of things, you know, to consider is definitely the economy and where the housing market is, um, if it's buyer, seller market, and what's going on. Um, but then you also need to look at, at your own self and what your tolerance is um, for spending, you know, what, what do you have, um, you know, in savings wise, because you're going to be laying out stuff, not only for the property, but then if there's repairs that have to be made before your first tenant goes in, and then how much do you have also, you know, put in the back pocket in case you can't rent it for a month or two, or you get a tenant that's not going to pay for six months until you can evict them. So you kind of got to weigh those two things together and determine really if it's really a financial time for you yourself um, to be able to be able to do it based upon your your own situation as well as the market situation. Great. Um, and then another like follow-up question, and why don't we have uh, Michael take a shot at this one? So when it comes to getting a loan on some of these properties, whether it's short term or long term, did you use like the traditional down payment? Um, how did you fund purchasing your property? So I, I did use like a, a traditional loan, and, and there's some rules around what you can do with a conventional uh, mortgage on a short-term vacation rental, especially if it's considered a vacation home. Um, so my honest recommendation is if you don't have a good mortgage broker that you trust to give you advice before making a purchasing decision, find one um, and really talk to them about the things that you want to do first and then get their perspective on the different ways that you can go about doing it, right? Um, you know, what parameters you need to be aware of, the down payment requirements could vary from, from your first home purchase. So like, uh, this is definitely one of those like lean heavy on professionals. This is what they do for a living. And, you know, they're only gonna make money if and when you do business with them. So uh, in the meantime, the advice is free. Um, and I, I'd probably let Trevor take the, the business side of the loan piece of it but similarly there are folks that advise on commercial loans and and their advice doesn't cost anything either so have a trusted professional that you work with um you know if if you if it sounds like they're just talking to you to try and get your money then talk to somebody else but there's definitely folks that will give you advice on the right way to go about doing this and just things that we didn't know we didn't know until we talked to somebody yeah, great. Trevor, do you have anything uh, to add as it relates to that topic and uh, the loan situation for purchasing a property? Um, 
I mean, I think the housing market right now is absolutely insane. Um, and I guess regionally, wherever you're at, you know, I live right outside of Chicago and everything is selling for 15 to 20% above ask. And ask is already crazy. So um, would I buy a property in the area that I'm in right now? No way. And some of the other cities that we we're looking, you know, like someplace in Colorado, possibly California, uh, Arizona, I would still say no, I'm pressing the pause button. Um, but it depends on what you're trying to do. I mean, is this, is this your business? Are you going to be like Sydney and buy a, you know, a bunch of properties? Are you going to be a landlord? Is, is that, is that your business model? Is that, is that how you're going to, you know, make your income, make your money, or is this more passive? Um, you know, did you find the right place? And you get, you know, it's the place that you definitely want to have as a vacation home for later on. So it's really situational. Um, but we are not actively um, working with any mortgage brokers right now on um, looking for our next couple of properties, but we're um, doing searches on our own and we're Thank God we're able to travel now and go into other places that we want to check out and then kind of earmarking that. So our, our approach to it is very gradual, very slow. I mean, it took us three years to find the right property, but um, it seemingly worked out very well because within a month of having it, we had renters. So uh, I was surprised by that, <laughs> but it did seem to work out. But I think it's just the planning, what you're trying to accomplish and what you know, what is in your family's needs. So it's, it's going to be very different for a lot of different reasons. Yeah, and that, that's a really great point. And it's something that Michael mentioned earlier too of, you know, his approach was, I just want to break even and then use this as a rental or as a retirement property later on. So if I can break even until then, then that's great. So yeah, I, I think that's a good way to summarize it is, you know, look at what your goals are and um, try to find a property that fits within that criteria. So our next question is actually for Cindy. And Cindy, you mentioned that you had a handful of tenants that were long-term tenants, and you also mentioned tenant screening. Uh, in that process. So what are some of the things that you would do uh, to screen your tenants? Um, yeah, we had a full application that they had to fill out. And then I can't remember the name of the company that we sent it off to to do a full background check on them. Um, there was like a $25 fee and the applicant paid that. Um, if I rented to them, you know, they got that credited back, but it ran the full screening on them. So I could see their credit score, their delinquency, their account status, all that kind of stuff. Um, I always did ask for references and I always called the references, their friends. I called their jobs, um, you know, to discuss um, how their references felt about them. So, um, you know, I, I did check them out pretty thoroughly. Great. Okay, next question um, for Trevor. So you've mentioned that uh, your property, it's rather large and you're looking um, for a higher nightly rate with minimum requirements and things of that nature for nightly stays. How did you determine the minimum stay? And then how did you determine what the nightly uh, rent would be? Mm. And does that ever change? Like does the nightly rent ever change? So great question. Um, we're, our town or our area, um, of the town of Elkhart Lake has a racetrack called Road America. So it has three um, very large resorts that are at it. And um, when we first got the property and set a price, we based that off of um, how many bedrooms we had, how many families we thought, the types of families that we thought would be affordable. And uh, the first year when we were talking to the other owners of the hotels near us, they were uh, disappointed and shocked with how low uh, our price point was. So they uh, encouraged us to increase it almost double it. Uh, we didn't do that. Um, I think there's a breaking point and we don't want to be anywhere near that. Um, we're looking for repeat. We're looking for, you know, good value. And, and again, what would we want to spend on it? 
Um, we do have a different rate for the week than we do the weekend. Uh, we pay attention to the events that are going on in our environment. Why are people coming in town? Um, for example, the Ryder Cup is coming up. That's a pretty unique experience. So a lot of the houses were going for five, six, seven thousand dollars a night. And if we weren't paying attention to some of the events that were coming through, if our place is fifteen hundred and everybody else is charging six thousand, um, we kind of you know are, are not in the right spot. So paying attention to the, the events that are in the area uh, has been something that we've learned. Uh, we didn't know right away um, where if there's a bigger draw and there's less inventory than supply and demand. And we're just naturally bringing up our prices a little bit. Um, uh, we also, uh, Michael got a very large hot tub for the draw for the winter months, um, but then that changed the balance of what we're charging. Um, so there's a handful of different reasons to what you charge um, and the number of you know, nightly minimum that you have. Um, so we're, we're playing with that. I think we'll make, uh, we made an adjustment the first year, the second year, and we'll, we'll definitely continue to learn from those adjustments. Um, but the one thing that we're trying to do is, is to be appropriate, to be kind, to, you know, to make it a good value, because uh, there's nothing more than all of us, everybody who's on, on this call, I mean, who likes to get ripped off? And then when you get ripped off and you feel like you've been you know, taken advantage of, then all of a sudden you're not taking very good care of the property. So we're not interested in, in creating any sort of negative karma that way. So we're trying to balance it out to being fair and still making it an income property. Great. And similar question for you, Michael, um, does Vicasa, do they do the pricing for you or do you have any um, ability to adjust that? Yeah, they so they manage the pricing based on their knowledge of the area, like what amenities your place offers. Um, so, you know, things that do well are multiple bedrooms, hot tub, pet friendly view of the water, right? So these are things that help. Um, a little bit farther away from the city, so it's a little expen a little bit um, less expensive, I should say. And so some of the other things, you know, they'll seasonalize it too. So like the winter months are definitely going to be a lot less expensive. You know, our occupancy rate during the winter months is quite a bit lower. Um, and then the other piece is like the number of tenants you want to have in a place, right? So there's a legal limit of how many you can have, but you know, there's some things that you might want to consider. So we started just not knowing and we're like, you know, they said, well, you're allowed to have eight guests um, based on the number of bedrooms and, and the rules of the county. So we started with that and we ended up getting some noise complaints from the neighbors. And so we decided to scale the, the guest uh, number back a little bit because you know, we, we want to be good neighbors. We want it to be a quiet, relaxing place. And if folks are having parties, like that wasn't the intent of, of the rental property. So I, I'd rather take a lower rental fee and not make as much money, but know that we're in good standings with neighbors that, you know, in the long term, we're going to end up wanting to be friends with. Um, but yeah, they take care of uh, one thing that they did early on, which which I thought was a great idea. They started, they said, our first like six months, we're going to rent this lower with the intent of getting interest. And the big thing is getting ratings and reviews, because those are the things that drive visibility of, of your uh, of your location up on like VRBO and Airbnb and a lot of these other sites. So that's exactly what they did. Um, rent flooded. We got a ton of reviews on the place and, and now they were able to increase rents a little bit uh, this this last year. And it's still packed because everybody wants to get away. It's got good reviews. It's got good visibility. So I think whether you're researching seasonality um, or you've got somebody else doing it for you, it, it's a great idea to take some of those factors into account. And then just, again, what kind of place and what kind of experience do you want it to have? And how can you do it in such a way that you're kind of a still a good steward of the neighborhood that you're in? Ah, great. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Cindy, it's interesting, right, hearing these two talk about how the price can change based off the seasonality and uh, different uh, factors like that. When it comes to long-term rentals, how did you set your price and what was the lease of the term that that price was good for? I always did mine on a, a one-year rent, uh, a one-year term. 
Um, and then as far as setting the price, uh, there are a couple of factors that I considered. I had to look at like what my expenses were, what my mortgage was, what utilities I was paying, um, subdivision fees. Um, so that came into play. And then also I looked at um, what other people were renting for similar type houses in the same uh, scenario, um, in the same um, subdivision area. And then also taking into consideration like what Trevor said, you wanna be kind and you also wanna be fair. Um, I didn't always increase my rent every year. Um, if I had a good tenant in there, they were upkeeping the property really good. Um, I didn't have any complaints from the neighbors. I would you know, keep the rent pretty stable. Um, I, I didn't see a need to increase it 50 bucks a month and just piss them off and have them leave. And then I got to find another tenant. I got to fix the house up and I'm without a month or two of rent. So, um, you know, just kind of breaking even, even some months uh, was okay so that you didn't have any issues that you had to deal with. Um, and then I always at the, during the holidays, I would always send them a Christmas card, you know, with a gift card in there for gas or something, just a little token of appreciation. Because I mean, you know, they're they're living there and they're paying me every month, and I, you know, want to thank them for being good tenants. And those little things do go a long way with keeping people happy. And then you can extend your business contract with them. So, great, thank you for sharing. So we have um, a couple more minutes left before we wrap things up here. I did want to get to a question that we had um, from the audience. And this is really for anyone in regards to your properties and if they are owned um, in your personal name or if you have them owned in like a business name, like an LLC or anything um, for liability reasons. There's three insurance people on this call, so I mean, I know we're all jumping. <laughs> uh, we love talking about liabilities. <laughs> uh, Trevor, we, any thoughts on that? <laughs> we did an LLC. Yeah, we dropped it in an LLC, and then um, no plug for American Family. Kind of. You better make sure that the insurance company that you're writing the property with understands it and the parameters uh, balance with that. Uh, because where you don't want to find out that you're not covered by insurance is at the time of a loss. So that would be the big thing. Um, there, there's tons of attorneys that can write LLCs. Those are pretty easy. Um, obviously, you want to make sure you protect yourself and the wording is right. But I would say the insurance is one of the biggest points. Um, Airbnb does provide a bit of insurance for us as well as a primary. Um, and then we have our secondary insurances that complement that. Great. Thank you for sharing. Um, in regards to just like next steps, so we've got a lot of folks on this call who are maybe thinking, okay, I now know that I do or maybe don't want to buy a short or long-term rental property. So um, could each of you share, like, what do you think they should do to get started? If they could do one or two things, um, what should they do to get started? And Michael, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, so one thing that I mentioned earlier is just that like whole mental psychological preparation thing. So like, I think make peace with, with the knowledge that, you know, the property that you get is you know, like the stuff that's in it isn't going to be yours. And they're not going to treat it the same way. Whoever's in there, whether it's short or long term, they're not going to treat it the same way you do. And that's fine because they're the ones that are using it and they're paying to use it. So I think like come to a, come to a good place from that mentally early on, it, it, it just helps psychologically later. And I think the one other thing that I will say is lean on experts as much as you can. Um, you know, anybody that's ever been successful in anything will all tell you the same thing is they all had a ton of help. Um, and there's a ton of experts out there that will gladly talk to you about this stuff. Um, some of them might charge you for it and some of them might give you free advice. Both are good, but you know, folks are experts in their field for a reason. And there's a lot of this stuff that I just don't know and have no experience in. So I'd rather trust somebody else. So they're out there and I highly encourage, you know, leaning on experts, kind of any chance you get, you know, you can reconcile that with what you've read and what your own kind of perceptions are, but it's good to have help um, and might as well take advantage of it since it's out there. Great, thank you. Um, Cindy, what is something that people can do to get started in um, searching for a long-term rental? 
Um, I think they really need to sit down and think about, you know, what what is their goal? Um, you know, do, do they want it to have just to buy, keep for two or three years and flip it? Or do they want it for a longer, longer term than that? Um, and, and that'll help them to figure out the next steps of where to start searching and um, that type of stuff. Um, but that's really where I started is what's what's my goal? Do I want it to cash flow every month or do I just want to flip it and then have a big cash flow from that? Um, so they really need to figure out what their personal goal is to figure out what type of property they want to buy. And then, you know, like Michael said, uh, you really need to talk to the experts, your real estate, your brokers, your insurance, um, your accountant too, because what you make can jump you into another tax bracket and you got to be prepared for that. Um, and especially if it's you're going to buy it and flip it, um, you got to be prepared for those tax implications too. So really talking to the experts is, is a great point to remember. Great advice. And uh, Trevor, so, same question over to you. What are some of the things that um, people can do to get started from your point of view? So I want to kind of compliment Michael's uh, statement, and that is you got to disconnect from it. We don't have a single family picture uh, in, in our house. Um, the other thing that we did that I think is really, really uh, was beneficial from a mental standpoint and a financial is we went and I didn't do this, my wife did all this, but she was able to find secondhand almost everything that we put in the house. So our house is six bedrooms, 4,000 square feet. So we had a lot of stuff to fill. And she was able to, with a $15,000 budget, fill the house. So you're talking tables, chairs, um, uh, you know, everything that basically operates throughout your house. Now, what we bought brand new were the items that were kind of the personal touch. So we bought brand new mattresses, brand new couch, all the bedding and the towels. And Costco is our friend. And they have great sheets, they've got great towels. And we bought four sets for each room. So we're able to turn it over. And if there is a mark on that towel, we're, we're recycling it. So the, the one thing that I was really proud of that we did with this property is we did source everything secondhand and Craigslist to, um, you know, antique shows to all, all the different places where you can buy, you know, items online. And we are getting, I mean, we have restoration hardware beds. We've got pure ones, like all this stuff that people are buying brand new and getting rid of their old <laughs> was, was our treasure. So it really did work out for us. I mean, buying hutches and tables and things like for a couple hundred dollars where they normally would cost two, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000. You don't need to buy a brand new hutch. You can put a little blood, sweat and tears in it and paint it, it looks brand new. Uh, but we did not skip on the bedding. We did not skip on the beds, the sheets. And uh, I bought a new air hockey table. That was pretty cool too, so. But yeah, I, that's how, that's, that, that would be my advice. Hey, you got to have those amenities, even if it's some air hockey. So that's great. Well, thank you each uh, for joining me today in this discussion. And thanks to our audience who had some great questions. And I will turn it back over to Andy. Thanks so much for that, uh, Katie. And, and thank you all, uh, panelists, for a, uh, a deep dive into that process. It uh, provided a lot of value for me, and I'm sure it provided a lot of value for the folks who, who tuned in here. Uh, speaking of which, if you are curious about some of our upcoming offerings or events that we've had uh, the past year, please go ahead and head over to our Facebook page. Press that events tab. Again, that'll give you a great list of what's coming up and what we've been putting out since about the end of March in 2020. Again, 11 different event series. We try and appeal to as many different dreamers as possible with those event series. With that being said, we will go ahead and cap it there and we will see you all next time. Bye.